Uh, with us today, we have uh, Grace Matthew from Stetson Family Office, uh, Dr. Andrew Kelly from BioPacific Partners, and Joel Hardy from Simra Life Sciences. Uh, so, just to make sure that everyone is here, yep, they are. That's great. Uh, so, uh, I think we might just do a quick round of introductions. So, uh, Grace, uh, if you're there, would you just uh, like to sort of tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, and who Stetson Family Office are? Hi, well, first of all, great to join all of you. Um, so, the Stetson Family Office is a third and fourth generation um, family office, and we, um, based in the US, uh, essentially, the wealth was originally created um, through uh, uh, basically an early stage investment in Coca-Cola. So um, Eugene Stetson was um, the original sort of principal of the family office. He was a relationship banker and um, he found uh, a little company which he tried to take public. They tried unsuccessfully to take this company public three times and he managed to do it successfully um, and he ended up being the longest serving board member of coca-cola um but, you know by the time that he passed away um, and then he then uh also was chairman of the guarantee trust to then uh merge that with a much less capitalized bank but that became um what is now known as jp morgan so um a couple of sort of interesting us yeah um a bit of interesting us history to the family um, of late, the family has focused a lot more on the life science and health space. Um, so the current principal, Chuck Stetson, um, is very passionate about seeing a shift in the way that family offices engage in philanthropy and investment um, in the life science space and uh, really moving towards more of a sort of venture philanthropy model and, um, and then also encouraging families to be uh, a lot more impact focused in how they invest their money. So um, over the last number of years, there have been a proliferation of family offices popping up around the world and particularly in the Asian region. Um, and so we've really taken a global approach to encouraging life science investment um, as being at the forefront of um, families focus, which it typically hasn't sort of been such a focus. Um, families tend to be quite uh, conservative in their approach to investing and um, they'll focus on things where there is an element of domain expertise um, but we believe that there are there is the ability to create pathways for families to um, become uh, you know more and more active in the space which is one of the three key growth spaces in investments in the coming years so that's um, that's a little bit about us in terms of myself um, I've got kind of an, uh, I suppose, an international relations and um, impact uh, uh, focused background. So I'm a bit of a mixed bag, but, <laughs> um, I, you know, it's been a lot of, a lot of learning and a lot of interesting um, conversations over the last couple of years. Right. Oh, that's, that's really, thank you. Thanks, Grace. Uh, and Dr. Andrew Kelly uh, from BioPacific Partners. Thanks, Jay. Um, my background, I think I'm here for my experience. My background has been uh, a couple of three decades uh, in the interface between the uh, research community and the commercial community. Um, I guess generally called commercialization, but a, a, a moderate chunk of that was on the research side. Another moderate chunk was on the venture capital side, investing in that area. And lately for my sins, I've formed a company that is actually bridging the two sides. Um, deal making really between global corporates and local inventions or innovations. So uh, that company, Bio Pacific, is the one that Jay introduced me as, and uh, and that experience is what I can hopefully uh, share with you today. Great, uh, Joel Hardy from Simra Life Sciences. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Joel Hardy, uh, CEO of Simra Life Sciences. I've uh, been working on the business for about three years, um, and I come from a background of of software and scaling software businesses in North America and in Asia Pacific. Um, we're a pharmaceutical focused cannabis pharmaceutical company. Um, and we're focused on two areas. One is around genetics. So providing agronomic benefit and yield benefit for growers um, in the cannabis space. And then secondly, um, creating novel pain medications for chronic pain as a second line therapy to opiates. Uh, we've got a pretty experienced board from a pharmaceutical and agricultural perspective that includes the ex-CEO of Alpha Farm, Asia Pacific, the ex-CEO of Blackmores um, in Australia, 
and um, the next director of um, Monsanto, which is now Bayer Crop Science. Uh, so super focused on on some of those targets that we're trying to achieve in the next few years. Thanks, Joel. And I think uh, one of the main drivers behind assembling a panel like this together is that we've got a really good split of you know corporate VC understand where the corporate touch point you know pressure points are and, and interest lies in this sector, and then we've got you know, the philanthropic and family office angle from having Grace here. And then, and then you know, on the other side of the fence, you've got Joel, who's, you know, just... Cowboy. Done, <laughs> the cowboy has done two very successful rounds, uh, two very successful rounds, um, sort of raising capital for uh, for Simra. And, and in not only is raising it in the health and life sciences space, but raising it in cannabis, which um, despite being a boomtown... Uh, I think he was a year after everyone went crazy about cannabis and, and he, you know, he's kind of come in a year after when uh, prices have dropped and, and it became quite tough and, and yet his company still managed to, to do really well and, and, and raise through that. So um, maybe just to keep things off, actually, while I've got you, Joel, is, is do you just maybe want to walk us through uh, the process that you went through, um, you know, round one? Um, and the types of investors that you had and versus versus what happened in round two. Yeah, and I think people will really understand um, sort of it's a fairly sort of typical progression from a capital raising perspective. The initial round one was really friends and family and, and you know, the, the third F falls where I think um, we had the blue sky and we had the, the dream of what we were going to do and we raised money from people we knew within the business, the people we knew from the uh, relationships on the board and just... Um, people that I knew as well from my network and we raised about $2 million to get going. Um, after a year, we quickly realized that wasn't going to be enough because there's a lot of capital investment in some of these things, uh, particularly when you're buying land um, or, or setting up schedule eight facilities. Um, and so a year later we had to do a series A and that was more targeted um, at high net worth um, and, a, and a few family offices, I think. And, in particular, the, the majority of success we had was through the Welsh wealth man management arms of sort of large uh, brokerage firms or uh, financial institutions. So mm -hmm. like Credit Suisse, Ordmanet, um, Wilson's, uh, Bell Potter, where they had people who were who had a portfolio of, of you know tens of millions and they were happy to invest you know, a million dollars into what I would consider more high risk investments, which was 10% of their portfolio. And we were taking uh, money from those people, or there was a fund that they had set up within those businesses that was controlled by the, the brokers. So mm. that's sort of the, the targets we went for, and that worked out pretty well for us and, and actually was quite easy to do, easy to do in the end, um, uh, last, end of last year. Great. Thanks, Joel. And so uh, by the sound of things, no corporates in there. So, uh, to ask Andrew Kelly that question is, um, you know, where would corporates have come in in a process like that, uh, and and what what are they interested in, and and you know how are they looking at the sector? Sure, corporates can uh, generally be divided into the two parts, the two arms that they use. One is their mainstream M and A or even equity investing. Uh, the parent, and the other is their venture capital arm, which sometimes have different motives. But let's deal with the first one first. The, the, the main uh, game of strategic investors, those big strategic corporates, is to gain new products, new innovations into a pipeline. Um, the the uh, corporate um, interest in this has boomed over the last 20 years, and, and more and more sophisticated teams and systems are in place in those big corporates to scout the world, to find things and to engage with them. Generally, they will engage um, earlier and earlier, the more novel or unique an invention is. So uh, if it's something like a, a, a little bit of a me too, it won't actually be very attractive. They'll wait for you to get revenue or get out there in the market, maybe even to annoy them a little bit by market share, by stealing market share before they'll make a, a move. But if you have something that is truly novel, a new mechanism of action, new approach, something like that, then the corporates will generally be willing to come earlier and earlier. The only difference with the second arm, which is the corporate venture funds, is that they uh, often are a law unto themselves compared to the parent. Sometimes they are directed to invest in the corporate areas of interest to the parent company. And believe it or not, other times they are directed not to, but to invest in 
over the horizon, next frontier areas. So it pays you to do a little bit of research on your corporate venture uh, firm before you engage with them, because sometimes it may not be as it appears. It may not be the logical way to get into the parent um, in the short term. And, and what are you seeing in terms of their, where their focus are, like your clients, are, are there specific areas in today's environment that they're focusing on? Sure, um, and believe it or not, despite their size and sophistication, they're relatively simple beasts at heart. Um, they are following the mega trends uh, mostly um, in the pharmaceutical area, oncology, oncology or oncology. They're the three main fields. Um, <laughs> they are very keen on that, but there's also um, a whole range of others, of course, that, that take their place. Um, in the consumer health world, um, the typical um, pursuit of pain, pursuit of inflammation, pursuit of mobility, um, and in the agricultural world, um, oftentimes it is around the classic agricultural pursuit of driving down the cost of production, but occasionally it's also about a rare or novel commodity. And in that sense, cannabis has boomed in recent uh, years because it is suddenly a, uh, a, a, growable techno a growable plant that is uh, able to be used for its truly wide range of opportunities. Mm. Thanks. So I guess we'll move this into family office land and, and Grace, uh, be keen to understand your uh, opinions on, on how the, the family office are investing in, and, and where is their focus at the moment? Yeah, I mean, you know, family offices, obviously each one is in, at some level sort of a world unto themselves. Um, but certainly there has been more interest in um, families investing in the life sciences space. Um, I think, you know, typically a family office, um, in most cases, they're not deploying at the same level as some sort of institutional funds. Um, but particularly around, you know, the current focus, you know, COVID has really driven a lot of interest um, and, and a lot of realization that there is a huge amount of um, money to be made in the life science space. And so um, families are starting to move more and more and be, you know, seeing sort of life science investments more favorably. Mm. Um, in terms of, you know, whether um, there's been any particular kind of theme, I think that um, the realization that technology is affecting the way um, life science companies can continue to be profitable and you know the fact that there's the ability to gather data and to use AI and apply these kinds of things um, into the life science space I think that's definitely become something um, which is kind of you know the the um, that kind of deep tech mindset has been applied to the life science space as well um, and so we're seeing families who are more and more interested in, you know, in the medical device space um, and seeing how they can also, you know, look for platform technology. So even if there's an approval um, for a device in one particular kind of, for one particular application, if there's the ability later on to gain approvals for various other applications for that type of technology. Um, and then also just looking at business models and looking to see if there are, you know, ongoing revenue streams, whether it be sort of the razor, razor blade type model or or um, you know what have you or even sort of the breaking up of IP and, and patents for again for other applications um, so there certainly is um, a lot more interest in the space I think um, for families who don't have um, you know a lot of a history of, of being in that space um, there's definitely a reticence to step into the area and so they're doing it a lot more through funds um, because they feel as if then they don't have to have internal domain expertise uh, and that yeah. is something and then the other thing TVs um, where you know families are coming together to co-invest in things um, and going on the back of sort of a lead investor who does have more more um, knowledge of the area yeah so that's um because you, you talked about from a number of different lenses there and and uh, I was unsure whether you're talking specifically about what Stetson as a family office where their focus are or other family office and and um, I think that's probably got to do with the fact that you were sort of part of organising the Global Family Office Bio Forum, and I'd like to, to you to unpack that a little bit. Uh, would that be great? Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think um, that you know all I, all of the comments that I just made probably apply both to Stetson Family Office, but also to the broader investment family office investment community. Um, we have 
for the last number of years created um, a community of uh, family officers who are interested in life science investment or philanthropy. And um, the focus has really been to um, see how we can continue to educate other family officers, uh, get them more and more active in the space. We've uh, basically got a network of um, around 400 family officers around the world. We've held uh, round table discussions, uh, in I think it's been about 21 cities around the world and um, the idea has been that um, you know as I mentioned sort of a lot of family officers there is that reticence to step into the space and so we've done whatever we can to facilitate um, knowledge sharing and um, co-investments uh, you know whether it be through funds or direct investments um, to allow them to get more and more involved. So the family office by global family office bio forum is something where we hold high level summits um, so we've We've been running an annual summit at the UN where we involve family offices, large pharmaceutical companies, uh, representatives from various governments, and, um, and then also you know, leaders in the not-for-profit space. Um, and we've, we are really interested in kind of moving the needle, not just so that we see families investing more, but also because we believe that families are uniquely positioned uh, to use, I guess, the weight of their um, investment and philanthropy um, to shift the focus, not just to finding cures for things, but also to really preventing um, disease wherever possible. And so that's, um, that's been our focus. So we've created this network um, and we're actually gonna be running uh, an online, a virtual conference in August where families will be able to really walk through a due diligence process with us. Um, and with some experts in the field and understand um, what it looks like to invest in the life science space and even join in some of the investments that we're doing. Right. Well, yeah, we'd be happy to help any way we can on that. I'm sure uh, there'll be a few people Great. Yeah, we'd love to looking cooperate. for your email and trying to sort of pitch their wares, uh, particularly the four companies presenting today. I'm sure they'd be interested in having a chat with you. Um, I've got so a maybe, couple of question, quick questions for both Grace and Andrew, if that's okay. Uh, just picking up on what you mentioned, Grace, um, could, could you comment, a, a, well, for both Grace and Andrew, could you comment a little bit more on how you go about scouting for quality deal flow? And, and you mentioned that um, families would like to prefer to band together to join in syndicates to, to co-invest. Um, you know, um, could that tie well with institutional investors or, or focused venture capital funds? Um, has that work? Uh, could it work well? Um, I, I'd love to hear both of, from both of you on that, if possible. Okay, maybe I'll start. Um, yes, to answer your question, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yes, essentially, um, we do see families who are um, investing with or on the back of the lead of um, a venture capital, you know, a, a fund that might be a, a lot more experienced in the space than they are. Um, so there is definitely that, you know, connection um, there. And I don't remember your other question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Where do you source your deal flow? Uh, or deal what are your primary channels for sourcing deal flow? Qualified deal flow. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we, I guess because of the fact that we have been so intentional about um, really not just cultivating our own network, network but actually, um, you know, kind of becoming leaders in the space internationally, um, we get a lot of deal flow coming towards us. Um, if anything, it's a case of kind of really just sorting through it and, um, and not getting lost amongst it all. <laughs> uh, we are um, also, you know, a lot of our deal flow will come from other families or other, you know, VCs or angels who, um, who have a lot of expertise in the space. Uh, I think families are an interesting one and, you know, the more, more you kind of work in this space, you realise that they really do like to stick together. And so the more that it comes through relationship or it comes through, you know, which is, I mean, for better or for worse, right? Like we saw the whole Theranos issue <laughs> happen and that was because of the fact that it was, you know, people were so trusting of each other's references and due diligence and just, you know, happy to take a referral from someone else. Um, and so, but, you know, despite the fact that that blew up in everyone's faces, it's still happening. <laughs> um, mm. So, yeah, I think, you know, we obviously have 
have our own internal processes, our own, um, our own due diligence team, but we certainly do uh, collaborate with other families and, and um, you know, get opportunities from those kind of references as well. Great. And Andrew? Yeah, thanks. Uh, from our perspective, we're, our business probably is trying to generate the leads that ultimately Grace sees in the, um, in the, in the wider investment community. So um, for us, it's a science and actually I employ a lot of people. <laughs> um, the art there is to triangulate and I guess what we use, we use multiple data sources, nearly all public source data sources, but it's the combination that, that throws up the magic. We search on publications, we search on uh, presentations, we search on patents, the three P. And those three things will generally uh, expose for us what we think of as a hotspot or an emerging area. Um, I'll, I'll go a little bit further in the hotspot. Um, there are lots of, of isolated examples where a brand new invention or deal or something that hasn't been seen before will emerge at the intersection of those three points. But even more rarely, you find that there is a particular lab in a university or a particular startup company which has three or four hits all together and that's what we really uh, delight to call a hotspot and we find the innovation there because often when you get into the um, into the lab or into the phone of those into the ear of those people you find that there's more coming out of those labs than even was available on public source so we are very keen to find new to world things that's our stock and trade and and it is quite an art but we generally use public source information um, just combining it in clever ways so I think uh, for, for a follow-up conversation, Jay and I would love to uh, follow up with you guys and Joey on uh, the concept of uh, Karetsu Syndicates, which is a global initiative that we're looking to collaborate with a number of other Karetsu chapters around the world with uh, respective different um, segments of expertise, including entrepreneurs and chapter members who have successfully exited uh, deals uh, or companies in, for example, biotech, life sciences uh, space to, to form uh, syndicates, if you will, uh, mm. to look at specific uh, niche categories of, of deal flow and assessment of deal flow from mainly proprietary ways. So if that's of interest, uh, we'd we'll love to share with you more uh, mm. afterwards. Cool. So just, um, just, I'm just conscious of time. Um, we do just want to have one little further insight from you guys, and 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 I think right at the moment we're in a in a state of frenzy of investing in life sciences and health, and and it, it is such a focus. And uh, I, I guess at first I'd ask Joel, um, you know, what's his interpretation of the current investment climate in health and life sciences, and and more specifically cannabis. A little tough right now, I think, in cannabis. I think the challenge has been that we've had a lot of uh, cowboys sort of um, come out and uh, increase stock prices where there's no value. Um, basically, invest in large facilities that aren't really that are white elephants. Um, haven't really had experience in pharmaceutical, or even nutri nutraceutical, or even CPG industries. They've sort of come from potentially mining industries, and no one on the board has been able to sort of control them. Um, and that's burnt a lot of shareholder value and a lot of capital. So there's a bit of a, a reputational issue amongst cannabis companies in the industry. I think um, where the opportunities m may be or where companies that I see are going to be successful are going to come from uh, sort of similar to what Andrew said. And, that, and that's going to take some time to be realistic about it is where people who are on the, on the path of research or um, developments around creating IP, where they can put a moat around something that's uh, either come from cannabis or some sort of administration method or something to do with um, the plant itself. And I think they're the areas that I see the, uh, the smart money, I think, go to. Now, it's a bit, has to be a bit more patient money um, in, that, in that regard, but I think that's where it's going to end up, particularly in Australia where... We're 100% focused as a pharmaceutical company. There is no opportunity for a um, you know recreational market right now. But I also think that um, if you are going down the recreational market, you need to be big and you need to be scalable and you need to be low cost because um, you know as things start to grow, it's going to be uh, hard to be someone who's trying to do that against you know international competitors. So that's kind of the the context of where the the cannabis market 
is at the moment. Um, and I think you'll see private companies who are achieving their milestones with solid growth or uh, solid IP development will still be able to raise money. But the larger ones, as we've seen on the stock market recently, have had to do raises at 50% of their valuations to, to raise money and they're only gonna potentially go further down from here. Yeah, right, okay. Well, yeah, so now, now I'm very interested to hear what Andrew and Grace have to say. So maybe Andrew, if you wanna, you, uh, you know, where, where, where do you think, uh, you know, current value is versus where it should be? Uh, you know, where, where, are the, where, are the, where are the good deals to be made um, in, in the space? Sure. Um, I, I think my overview comment on that one, Jay, would be that the market's behaving pretty irrationally at the moment. Irrationally, that is. Um, and and um, I'm thinking of a favourite saying of my father, like a dog in a paddock full of rabbits. Um, people are, are pursuing the hot COVID stocks or the hot COVID companies as they emerge. Then another one emerges and they lose interest in the first one. Um, what we're finding, and I think Joel's probably suffering too, is that the common good, good companies and good opportunities out there are just languishing through lack of oxygen. Um, people are not looking at across that steady um, Warren Buffett type look across the, the landscape to just say where are the good opportunities. Um, a bunch of companies and I, I follow and own a lot of stocks, a bunch of companies that are making good announcements and good progress are getting zero traction from the market. The market is just ignoring them and that's because down the road there is a shiny new COVID thing that suddenly tripled in price. So uh, that's not a good answer for you, Jay, but it is actually saying that right now, um, yes, there's money to be made in COVID, there's no doubt about it, but it is a little bit of um, a random chance <laughs> uh, to do that. And, and I'm sort of despairing a little bit and hoping that soon a little bit of normality will return to the market and people will start saying, no, forget about COVID, this is a very good um, solution for acne or this is a very good such and such and so there's still there's still plenty of fair value good deals out there oh, i go sorry i should have said that i think there's some excellent value deals out there at the moment right. okay great yeah. of that lack of attention i think there's many a good company that deserves and on a normal time would be worth twice what they are today great and grace deal to be thanks done. andrew yeah i would really agree with andrew's um insight I think that, um, you know, particularly with how COVID has sort of thrown attention around, I really liked the analogy of a dog in a paddock of rabbits, because um, <laughs> I think that there has definitely been some erratic behaviour by investors um, on that front. But I think that also those who have more of an understanding of the sector are realising that um, betting on some of the smaller companies, um, particularly in a space like COVID, is uh, not so, it's, I mean, it really is like a bet um, because a lot of the outcomes are binary um, and then also because um, the, the success of a company is not just predicated on the effectiveness of the technology or the, you know, answers that they have, but it's also on their ability to produce at scale once they come up with something. And so in a lot of cases, particularly if you're investing into a smaller cap company um, or a small cap stock um, in biotech, it, um, you know, some of the fundamental and detailed analyses don't work because really what you're betting on is whether or not that company will get acquired by one of the bigger players. Um, and that's often where the money is made. So um, yeah, it's just, it's a really, it is a really interesting time. I, I do think that, um, you know, the valley of death, the valley of death, which is going to, um, is becoming more and more of a rocky road. Um, and a lot of it mm. seems to come down to how shiny, you know, people can make the investment appear and how trendy and how much press. And so, you know, you've seen very, very large, large amounts of investment go in on the back of, essentially just press releases. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's really worthwhile for investors to look a little bit deeper into really what the technology is that has been developed, um, you know, how potentially, you know, just trying to be a little bit more accurate in um, how deeply they're assessing investments rather than just being really pulled by a great narrative. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely.